Hello, everyone, and welcome to Storytime with Mr. Jackson. And today I'm happy to announce the first video in a new series I've called Barons at Sea, a fantastic true story of the Dutch search for the Northeast Passage, fabled sea route to China over top of Arctic Russia. Well, we're waiting. The troubles began in late fall of 1597. It was then that a tired and battered ship, remnant of William Barents' third expedition north, sailed into Ice Harbor, farthest refuge in a land they called Nova Zembla. Their tiny ship had been cutting through ice-infested seas for months now, and the crew aboard was tired, every man among them desperate to escape the fierce storms and jagged shifting ice, if only for even a day. So to them, this place seemed as good as any, rest the only thing really occupying their minds. But just like any mortals in a tragedy, that which they sought eventually destroyed them. For as soon as they dropped anchor, the ice which they had attempted to escape came in after them as if stalking a fugitive. And it all happened in slow motion, each man watching with a curious detachment as if it were happening to someone else. Just simply couldn't be real. But alas, it was all too real. The Dutchmen could only stand there slack-jawed and amazed as their vessel of exploration, their only means of action in these frozen waters, was first struck and then physically lifted out of the water by a massive iceberg. And the ship's agony was intense. The sound of creaking timbers and splintering wood heard loud and clear even over the roar of the crashing ice all around them. It was all Barents and his crew could do to escape unharmed, and soon they all assembled on shore. Each man looked to the wreck that was once their home, then to the surrounding landscape, rocky and sterile. Looking upon the wreckage of all their fortunes, the men must have sighed. They'd come to this frozen world in search of a way to China, in search of riches and fame beyond all rational measure. They'd wish to be the equals of men like Vasco da Gama, opening entire regions of the globe once thought inaccessible. But now what? For already the temperature was beginning to fall, and each man knew that the eternal darkness of polar night wouldn't be far off. Right about then, each man had the same thought run through his mind. What the hell are we going to do now? Okay, that's what I didn't want to have happen. Um. Three years earlier. Now being trapped in the ice is all well and good, but you might be tempted to ask, like, why? Like, why was a tiny ship of barely 70 tons anywhere near the ice to begin with, let alone all by itself? Well, believe it or not, they did have a perfectly logical reason to be up that far. And what else but money? You see, these guys were up there in search of the fabled Northeast Passage, gateway to the east and shortcut to the wealth and markets of China. Now you might ask why the Dutch didn't just sail around Africa or South America. I mean, wasn't the New World discovered back in like 1492? I mean, for real though, the Spanish and the Portuguese have been doing this for nearly a hundred years at this point. Why couldn't the Dutch or the English? Well, the short answer is that these routes east were guarded and were considered national territorial waters by the empires of the Iberian Peninsula, Spain and Portugal. And to make matters worse for the Dutch, Spain, Portugal, Austria, and Germany had united to create a massive superstate which ruled not only Europe, but most of the New World as well. This empire ran on Aztec gold and Peruvian silver, and no one was very keen on sharing. And to make matters even worser, this kaleidoscope empire was controlled by one family, the House of Habsburg. Now, the Habsburgs are known for exactly two things, inbreeding and world empire. And at this time, both pastimes were in full flower. Just look at this band. Well, eventually, what's now the Netherlands took issue with the House of Habsburg, revolting under the banner of the House of Orange after William the Silent finally began talking. <clears throat> anyway, all this happened around the year 1566, the fighting continuing on and off until the Treaty of Westphalia some 80 years later. Well, in the meantime, though, it was on with Dutch and Habsburg forces fighting battles as far away as Indonesia and as close to home as Harlem or Gibraltar. The war was a brutal and long conflict, seeing the Low Countries split along religious lines, with the Protestants and Calvinists going to the Netherlands and the Catholics staying in Flanders, what's modern-day Belgium. Anyway, it was in this powder keg of religious warfare and international trade monopolies that our particular story begins. Allow me to introduce you to the real star of our story, or at least that's how he would have seen himself and most likely introduced himself. One Jon Hugen von Linschut of Ankhausen. Adventurer, explorer, spy, and self-promoter extraordinaire. Somehow, Mr. Linschoten had made his way all the way to India of all places, where he had worked as a double agent for a number of years. Bond. 
And as it turns out, the Portuguese Archbishop of Goa really grew to rely on von Nidschoten as a man of proven talents. And riding shotgun with the bishop did have its benefits, giving von Nidschoten a first-hand tour of most of the eastern seas, traveling from India to Japan and stopping just about everywhere in between. And von Nidschoten saw this access for what it was, an opportunity. And thus he began to write down everything he saw in separate logs. He also copied and <clears throat> stole any and every Spanish and Portuguese chart he could safely lay his little mitts on. A crime punishable by death, by the way, and not a good one either, like real slow. And despite some touch and go moments and not more than a few close calls, von Linschoten eventually made it all the way back home with most of his notes and even a few stolen charts in tow. And even the notable cartographer and mathematician Patras Plumkius lent him a hand going through his notes and charts and providing certain insights. Once completed, the pages of Von Linschoten's work contained many secrets and game-changing tidbits that enlightened many an ignorant northerner. For the first time, the routes under Africa and through the Indian Ocean that Vasco da Gama himself had discovered in the 1490s were made known outside of intended circles. Just one secret of many. Now his work would in time be recognized as a major factor in the rise of the Dutch trade empire, with Von Linschoten himself still revered to this day by a grateful nation. Because for the first time, a Dutchman now had detailed information about the approaches east. And better yet, who and what they might find when they got there. Who hated whom, and most of all, who mattered and why. And his crimes against the Spanish Habsburgs were akin to that of Alan May and others who spied for the Russians during the Manhattan Project. said, you're ugly, you're disgusting, I'm gonna kill you. With their efforts directly leading to the Soviets getting a bomb of their own only a few years later. Now you'd think that being the architect of the Dutch invasion of the East would be enough for von Linschoten. That he would rest on his laurels and sit by a fire somewhere fanned by feather-clad slaves, but then he'd be wrong. Because why would I even bring him up? Oh no, von Linschoten was going to make another even better route. A secret route, shorter and more effective than anything a mere Habsburg slave could ever hope to find. He would be the father of all Dutch trade if he had anything to say about it. Call me Trade Jesus. Well, to achieve this, von Linschoten put out the bat signal, calling for the best minds the new republic could offer. And together, they would crack the north wide open, for glory and mostly for profit. Well, several leading men answered the call, foremost being Petrus Plancius, whose writings and influence is hard to overstate for the time. Along with these voyages, old Petrus was consulted by kings and foreign dignitaries about all manner of subjects. The man's something of a celebrity. Now, several years later, Henry Hudson himself would consult with old Petros before setting out on his own ill-fated 1611 expedition. But that's a story for another day. Von Linschoten achieved another coup when he managed to hire one William Barents, one of the most experienced sailors and mapmaker in all of Europe. William Barents was born in the year 1550, probably, in the region of Terschelling, maybe, and was by all accounts a sailor and navigator all of his life. For in a long career behind the mast, he had traveled and mapped just about every sea there was to sail around the European continent. He was an experienced navigator and cartographer, and even published one of the first professional atlases in the Mediterranean Sea. But more than that I can't say for certain, as in later years every town claimed him as a son, and hundreds of apocryphal stories about his exploits circulated unchecked. Unfortunately, it seems like the interest in the man has obscured him from us, as his life is now a tangled knot in which fact and fiction live side by side. But what I can't say for certain is that by all accounts the man was personable and seemed even popular with the sailors that served under him. He's come down to us as a fair man and a dreamer, a professional with the touch of the romantic. But most of all, the man seemed to be fearless at the helm, being known as a man who would push just a little farther and try just one more time. Well, now that von Ninschoten had assembled his dream team, he began to discuss the subject of New Routes East. This council of professionals eventually came up with a few options. They already knew of the long way, the traditional African and South American routes, but these were guarded by angry little tan guys with cannons and not exactly ideal. Next longest was the fabled Northwest Passage, a route thought much shorter than the traditional sea routes, but the problem was, nobody could find the damn entrance. And at this point, the English had been trying for at least 50 years, but apart from some fake travel logs and the word of a few brave con men, looking at you, Sebastian Cabot, no, no one could really say where it was. And the English never found the passage, despite a national effort that lasted for nearly 300 years. No, that honor would eventually fall to a tall Norwegian named Roald Amundsen in 1906, a man who seemed to have made an entire career out of upstaging the English. But that's a story for another day. No, the West wouldn't do either. So the council then turned their gaze east, 
But they did have a rough outline of the northern coast of Russia at this time, and from what they could see, the land seemed to drop away abruptly somewhere past a semi-mythic island called Nova Zembla. If their maps were even at all accurate, this meant that previous sailors had probably already reached the end of the Asian landmass. And so they speculated that there might be an open sea to the south of Zembla, and that, God willing, this sea would lead their ships all the way to northern China. If this was accomplished, gone would be the middlemen, gone the threat of attack. I mean, if this worked, they would have just found another way to the source of all wealth and exotic items, fabled cafe. Most members of the council focused on this route as the most viable, as similar to Bartolomeo Diaz and the early Portuguese captains. They hoped to stay near land in semi-known sea routes for as much of the voyage as possible, building on what others had already accomplished. For not only could they trade information with any locals they found along the way, but they could also scout the surrounding landscapes for anything useful like fresh water or a place to moor their ships, hell, even herds of caribou or reindeer, anything. Despite their ignorance, they did know the north to be a fairly sterile place, and anything remotely helpful would be of the greatest value to any polar traveler. Well, Plankius and Varence agreed with most of what von Linschoten had said, but felt that hugging the Russian coast would be kind of a waste of their time. These two contended that the shortest distance between two points was a straight line, and asked, why wasn't it possible to just head straight north over the pole? Wasn't the world round? I mean, why take a longer route than you have to? I mean, just, just look. After some theatrics, they then showed on their maps that the land of Zembla continued north for hundreds of miles. And so there you go. Why risk going south when a ship could simply hug her shores due north? Everyone gets what they want. Well, this made more sense than you might first think, especially at the time as Petros Plancius was a believer in warm polar seas, contending, as so many would after him, that there be no ice at the pole, for all ice floweth south. He contended that the long polar summer and the constant sunshine should have melted most of the ice above 80 degrees latitude. And when asked about plains of ice encountered by Greek and Scandinavian sailors in centuries past, he simply scoffed. Petros explained that these pieces simply froze together when they reached the colder south. And if anything, these planes of ice around 80 degrees north proved his point. I mean, they had to be coming from somewhere, right? Something was moving them. He contended that if a ship could simply break through this ring of ice, they would have an easy time sailing an almost ice-free northern ocean. All they would need to do then is break through on the other side, and presto, China would be waiting. Now, von Linschoten wasn't happy about any of that. All that stuff Plankius was talking about, warm seas and rings of ice, just sounded awful and stupid. Way harder than just hugging the northern coast of Russia and seeing where it led. I mean, even if he did breach the ice at 80 degrees, who's to say he'd have that kind of luck on the other side? Any ship that entered that warm sea might just end up stuck and unable to escape before the freeze came. And besides, he was out to forge new commercial routes east, not go in search of the unknown. He already knew where he wanted to go. And to him, it was just a matter of getting there. Why overcomplicate things with fairy tales and eldritch horrors? After a short back and forth, they agreed to split the difference, with two ships going for von Linschoten's southern route under Zembla and along the Russian coast, and another group of lighter ships would head north to crest Nova Zembla and probe the endless pack ice to its north. Von Linschoten wasn't exactly happy, thinking anything north of his route was just a waste of time and energy, but relented all the same. He did have to admit that the old man had a few good points. Best to try while they could, he supposed, for no one knew what this world had to offer. The Netherlands were soon abuzz with talks of riches and new opportunities to the north, and in its own way it was an idea whose time had come. As before it was mentioned, few people if any cared about the far north, but after? After the word was out, all sorts of folks got all sorts of ideas in their head. For many already knew of the wildlife up there, of the valuable oils and ivory, of baleen and pungent musks, so many bet that even if China wasn't reached this season, that these ships would still most likely come back laden with all sorts of valuable gory goodies. By the spring of 1594, three cities had put up cash for the expeditions. Or should I say, merchant leagues within them put it forward. As the States General was a little preoccupied with fighting or preparing to fight the Spanish. And so as with most of these early expeditions, they were private affairs. had sailed Norwegian and Russian waters in the past, 
Also, he had a young Russian boy with him that he totally didn't kidnap from a local university and press into service that also knew the waters. Hmm. Either way, Ney and this guy who totally wasn't a captive knew the waters all the way to the Russian port of Archangel. They knew ice and knew some of the headwinds and currents, leads and shallows. So in short, their expertise would be vital. However, expertise could only take them so far, and these three ships were tasked with setting a course for one of the farthest pieces of land yet known, tasked with going to the end of the map, Nova Zembla. And to give you an idea of how utterly barren this place is, it's the exact spot where the Russians chose to drop the Tsar Bomba on October 30th, 1961, largest man-made explosion ever. I mean, even its flag alludes to its barren and threatening nature. It's got a couple of bears holding an atom. Ugh. It's a land where no trees grow, its only vegetation being small shrubs and grasses, moss and lichen. Mmm, yum. Its animals mostly include foxes and polar bears, and that's pretty much it, aside from the odd seabird. It's as close to a godforsaken wilderness as you're likely to find on this earth. Well, thankfully for the fleet, getting there really wasn't the main goal, as even they knew that Nova Zembla had little to offer but whale parts and frostbite. No, it was but a landmark on the route to China. They simply aimed to map her shores and move on once they could find a way around. Nothing more. As theirs was meant to be the first chapter in a saga of discovery. I mean, they all knew how long it had taken the Portuguese to round Africa. Nearly a hundred years. And they weren't so bold as to think they could reach China in one go, but... Just as the Portuguese had gone step by step down the African coast, so too would the Dutch in Northern Asia. But first they would need to know if any resources existed on Nova Zembla. As best case scenario, they could use her beaches as a depot or even a resupply point. And worst case, they'd simply map her shores and show any and all routes through and around so future sailors could spend as little time there as possible. Theirs was about to be a voyage of pure discovery, literal trailblazing for the benefit of those to come after. But that in mind, if things went exceptionally well, they could always press on to China, capturing all the glory for themselves. Only time would tell. Join me next time as the expedition takes its first steps into the ice. Chips will they suffer, and what might they find when they get there? All questions to be answered on the next exciting episode of Barents at Sea.